Hello, everybody. Welcome in to another edition of Head Coach U. I am Brian Fisher, joined, as always, by former BYU and Virginia head coach Bronco Mendenhall and a special edition uh, this week as well with uh, former Naval Academy head coach and current UCLA Director of Leadership, Ken Neumatololo. And, and Ken, I got to ask about that that title first and foremost. W- w- was that your idea or was that Chip's idea? Um, it, no, it was, it was definitely Chip's idea. I mean, it's his program. And so he had called me uh, maybe in late January, early February, just seeing what I was doing and, you know, was interested in having me on staff and kind of was looking for a position. And we just talked about some things and then told me he'd get back to me. I just kind of waited and he came with this, this position. We're still figuring it out, to be honest with you. I mean, Bronco, you know, like, like hey, what does this guy do? And just, um, and so I, I come, I found myself, I went there and was there for spring ball. Um, as Bronco knows, you know, being a former head coach, I was very careful. I don't want to come across, hey, have you ever tried this? Like, have you ever had this many periods? You know, I didn't want to come across the guy with all the answers. I just sat back because Coach Kelly's head coach, and he's a really, really good head coach. So I, I just sat back and see what he wanted to do. And really some of the stuff's, you know, just kind of evolved from, you know, that way. It's just kind of Coach Kelly's vision. And I've come to realize a lot of it's been informal stuff, you know, just talking with the other assistant head coaches and just sitting down with them and just, you know, I'll just sit down and tell them, what are some of your goals? Or what do you aspire to? And, they're, you know, those are some of the things that happen. Or our player, you know, I'll just be at practice. Again, Bronco, you know, this just being a head coach, you watch everything. You know what I mean? Just you're just watching everything. You can't be full. You just, your eyes got to be everywhere. You know, the, the, uh, the water people get in the water to the wide receivers when they come back from fade routes. You know, just all these things that like, what are you looking at? Just just making sure, you know, this is happening there. Just making sure the drills are spread out far enough that somebody doesn't get their legs taken up because two tackling drills are five yards apart and it can be spread out a little bit more. But I'd go to practice and just watch. And if there's a player that seemed down and maybe wasn't getting as much reps, I was just going to just talk, hey, how you doing? Hang in there. Just keep grinding, come out early tomorrow to practice, you know, work on your routes. Just silly things like that. Just I've just kind of um, not try to just remember it's Coach Kelly's program. And if there's something he wants me to do, there's some things he's asked me to do, but uh, it's kind of evolved and it's there's there's no blueprint on it. You know, I mean it's it's kind of a unique uh position because we're still trying to figure it out. Yeah. You know, there's there's huge value, though, in having uh, another experienced, capable voice of reason on your staff that can be trusted, especially for the head coach. And as a head coach, and, and I'm not sure if you found it this way, there's very few people you can truly talk to um, about things of real significance. And um, there's a certain amount you can share with your wife. And, and I learned that the hard way. I started sharing nothing. And she was learning about things from other people. So that didn't go well. And then I started sharing everything. But then who does she share it with? Because it can't be shared. So that was too much of a burden. And then we've over time, we kind of found a delicate balance. But even with assistant coaches and coordinators, not everything can be shared. The same with the athletic director. And and so really, it's very difficult. And when I had Ruffin McNeil on my staff as a former head coach, I hired him right after he was released to East Carolina. Wow, did I find comfort and peace in being able to just, and he was the assistant head coach was his title, but it was great just to have um, another former or experienced head coach be able to come into my office and he and I just talk and share. And much uh, much like what you just shared, uh, Ken, the, the ability to, to reinforce that everybody is somebody and another set of eyes looking for uh, a player whose body language doesn't look quite right or that might be disengaged, or when when um, the program is really understood, having someone else being able to just reinforce the principles, because as a head coach, it's hard to be everywhere, even though you're expected to be everywhere. And it's hard to see everything, even though you're expected to see everything. And, and so having someone else that's really wise, an experienced leader, certainly fiercely capable, that's also aligned, man, I, I could see huge value in that. And and I bet from your perspective, 
maybe it's nice to be able to to be to be um maybe heard but not seen as much and so what what's that been like is maybe not being the one that everyone's looking to it's it's been awesome yeah <laughs> it just um but you're exactly right Bronco, because there's you know we have had some chip and i have had some discussions and we just know there are things that you can't share with an assistant coach, you know, because sometimes uh, when you're not a head coach, everybody's got a lot of suggestions. But when you're in that seat pulling the trigger, people have no idea yeah. the pressures, the different factors involved, yeah. you know, about a player. You know, they might see a certain part and you have to make a decision about somebody and they're like, hey, why are you doing that? But they don't have all the yeah. – they don't have all the information. You know, they're making – some some judgment calls when they don't know everything. And so, yes, I, I found that that's happened already. Just some of our discussions would just talk. And as like, I'm sure you found too, Bronco, just talking to other head coaches, um, there's stuff you can share with them that they get. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, and it's not that you're smarter than anybody, but just experience wise, just some stuff that you've had to deal with. It's a lot different being in that seat, making those calls. But I found just being in this uh, role, it's been very rewarding for me to sit back and just to listen and to learn. Um, Bryce McDonald, who's the chief of staff here at UCLA, used to be in my DFO, mm -hmm. you know, at, at Navy. And so he comes to me every day, I coach, you okay? You okay? And, you know, just worried about me because um, cause he, 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 I think it's weird for him to see me in his light. Yeah. You know, I mean, he came from where I made every, you know, I was making all the decisions, uh, you know, was the last decision maker, I guess, just to say to make all the decisions and to a staff meetings or meetings where I, I don't say a word. Yeah. You know, I'm just in the corner. But it's been really good for me to sit back and just learn, observe. My son is on the staff. Uh, he's a graduate assistant. And it's probably one of the probably the biggest reason that I came because you know, I don't know how long I'll do this, an opportunity to be with him. Uh, my other son that you know actually uh, played for Bronco uh, is an assistant coach at Navy. I always joke with him. The three years being with him were the worst career of my record-wise my last three years. Before. <laughs> One of the worst records, but it was the best three years mm. of my coaching career. Because, you know, um, my wife, I mean, my daughter-in-law and her, you know, daughters were there. So my wife got to be with them during his three years. And I think it was interesting. I think my son, too, got to see a different light, too. You know what I mean? Uh, just coming to meetings, just seeing stuff. So I think his appreciation, give an example. So he recruits the West Coast now from Navy. And so I'll talk to him sometimes. He's, you know, he's talking about spring recruiting that I had to catch a red eye. I left at this time, had another red eye, got back at this time. So I was just, how's the weekend going? Dad, I'm dead, but I got to go back out again, you know, whatever. When Sunday night and hit the road, and I just kind of laughed. I said, son, I did that for 12 years when I was an assistant. You know what I mean? So if you're looking for sympathy, hit it, brother. I mean, this is the profession you chose. It's hard. It's hard work. It's not for everybody. I don't know. I have no idea, but both of my sons got into the profession. Bob. I tried to, I tried to get them to do something else, man. Okay. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, it's been different being in that seat that you're not making all decisions. But it's been a good one, and to he watch Chip, see how he does things, uh, it's been learning for me. I, I learn and grow and see how he does things, how he runs his program, decisions, why he does them. And so my meetings when I, when I, when I go there and. I sit in the corner of my laptop and just taking notes, just trying to learn from him. If he has some questions, we'll, you know, or anybody has questions, I'll, you know, we'll talk. But we've had some dis other discussions about some of the stuff that you talked about. Just, yeah. you know, sit down and talk and I, what you said is right. The, the perspective is, is much different from being an advisor to the decider. And I've, I've had, and I'm sure you have as well, um, so many um, assistant coaches or others come into my office and they're they're very confident in their opinion with the information they have. And so most that would come into my office uh, and I'm, I'm wondering if it was the same for you is they would come in um, with their agenda 
the information that they possess, their point of view, a, a, a timeline that would work for them and an outcome that they were hopeful for with partial information. And, and that is uh, really anyone that came in and, and how could they truly have all the information? Uh, and so the existing points of reference from really anyone other than a, another head coach coming in that sees it all and is making a comprehensive view. Um, yeah, it was always a challenge. Yeah, I because think, he, go ahead. No, I think what you said is right, Marco. That the words you you know just said is just comprehensive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just your perspective. I mean, like like I said, I'm not. I'm, I'm just a person. I always say that like guys would always talk about it. Oh man, we're gonna have this great scheme, and we're gonna be. And this, they're not like guys. They got guys over their brains too. You know what I mean? <laughs> they're 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 breaking down film too. They got the same cut ups. I mean, they got everybody's got the technology. So. You know, let's let's just keep grinding. But it's like you said, just the perspective. I think is um, what I think being a head coach because you the way the lens that you look through. Mm -hmm. I think the one that I always thought about is just in recruiting. Sometimes you could see because you know how the recruiting process went. So you could see a guy how much time he spent on this guy, if it was position or his area. He recruited kid. But then when it came to playing time and different things, you would see a guy fight for a certain kid and you weren't seeing the same things. Like, mm -hmm. But you're like, hey, you know, I'd always have to remind guys, it's like, you guys, um, we're all in this together. And, you know, sometimes you might be attached to a kid, but the best kids got to play. You got to set aside all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I said this, and I know it's hard. I was, as being an assistant, I know it's hard because – if you don't fight for your kids that you recruited, you're a bad recruiter because it's all about relationships. Where I was, I think things have changed out, and I know, but it was all about relationships. And so you're going to be close to the kids that you recruited. But when it comes to playing, you know, sometimes you might have made a mistake, and we can't even have too many of those. But you can't look through those biased eyes mm. when you're trying to evaluate results, what he's doing, you know, and his efficiency, and those kinds of things. And so I, those are some of the things sometimes that you'd see yeah. that maybe an assistant coach wouldn't see because they're looking at it from this lens and they're like, you're trying to look at the totality of it. Hey, just take that lens off. Hey, we're trying to feed each other's families. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bottom line is we, you know, we, we're all in this together. You can't have your eyes so set on this guy that he's going to play when he's not the best player. Yeah. And he's not doing the best things. So, you know, I think, I think that perspective, uh, and and I, I saw that a lot of times with miles traveled by a coach. And if they had to take two flights and then drive and then catch another flight and man, they were more hopeful to like that player because of the time, energy and effort they had spent. And sometimes even once they had signed with us, um, especially if it took extra time, energy and effort for the fit, either academically or socially. And so more, the more time they invested actually, it was fantastic because the relationship was deep, but actually the more biased they became in terms of actually seeing the ability objectively. And I think as head coaches, we have to be careful as well because that can happen with our own staff members. Yeah. Uh, on my staff in particular, uh, uh, almost every one of my coaches was, uh, they played for me and then were graduate assistants and then they were position coaches slash coordinators. And that's a lot of time, energy and effort invested and so I think any leader also, as you, I think you called it biased eyes, right? It's, it's nice to, to have measures built in place where you can try to remain objective, even with your own staffing, you know, not, not only assistant coaches, but your own program. And I think just as I'm, list, as I'm here, I think that could be something that, that you'll end up adding huge value to, to Chip and his staff is just another set and maybe, maybe the most unbiased eyes on his staff. And having a fresh perspective that way, I could see that being huge, adding huge value. Yeah, I'm hopeful. You know what I mean? But I just, um, but you're right. I mean, as a head coach, I mean, you got to try to do your best. You know, to make sure you don't have those biased eyes towards a. You know, you're closer to the other staff members. You know what I mean? And might get along better with so and so. Might have a better person, uh, better relationship. Um, but I. I I think you said the same thing, Bronco. I mean, you have to try your best in this profession. Um, to there are all the egos you got to leave at the door when you come in, and hopefully, any you, personal feelings you might have towards somebody, 
better be result based. You know, I mean, just you know how he's doing, and just um, and maybe it's it, you know it's based on principles that you think are are important for your program. But if you're doing that kind of stuff and having favoritism towards a certain person, it just is you know what I mean the things don't last too long because yeah. you can't, but you're human. Sometimes you, you know, you get along better with so-and-so than you do another person. But when you go home, you have to try your best to reset. You know, if there are any of those types of feelings that you might be having, then you gotta make sure you get away from them. I, I used to come early to work and it's not that I was watching film earlier than people, but just a lot of, it's time for me to be alone, just think through things. Maybe a question like that, just you said, Mark, it's just like, okay, just uh, so so's really making me mad. But <laughs> just, you know, talk to him, communicate clearly. How do I get to this guy? I told him, you know, stop doing that drill. He still does it. You know what I mean? And I don't want to have to fire him tomorrow, but I'm going to have to get to this guy. You know, just, you know, this, just things like that. How do I communicate with him? Or how do I let him grow? What are some things that I can help him where I'm not micromanaging him? But we also, there's also things you want to get done. Yeah. And, you know, you, you can't have, you know, 10 different guys doing their own way of doing things. Yeah. You got to set some principles here, the way we're going to do things. Like a defense, I mean, you're I mean, one of the best defensive minds around, Bronco. That wasn't my specialty. But I just told the guys that were my court, and I just wanted certain principles. I want, there was one thing I wasn't going to compromise. We were going to run to the ball. You know what I mean? We were going to be the team. I wanted guys... When they looked at our tape, they're like, wow, look at Navy guys run to the ball. I didn't care if we were out front, even front, you know, what we played, one high, middle open, whatever. Just, But I just wanted to make sure we ran to the ball. Um, and then I had some other stuff. But that was one thing I wouldn't, I, that I would never mm -hmm. compromise. And so, you know, those are the kind of things I think, like you said, that as a head coach, you try to make sure that you're doing things that are – that are clear, uh, but also things that um, you take all your your personal feelings out of it. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. hey, because you know you guys don't have the same interests. <laughs> it's a heck of a coach, and maybe you don't have the you know maybe you both don't like the NBA or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just um, just make sure that your your opinions of the person are you know. Going in the same direction because this profession is so hard. It's grueling. It's ruthless. I mean, everything's got to be going in one direction, or you don't have a chance at all. Yeah. And I, like I said, it's kind of interesting because you understand that. You know, what I mean, it's it's so hard. There's so many different factors. There's so many different factors. Like, um, but I mean, I've, I've been to a couple of your games, and you know, because you know, my son played. You know, one bowl game I came to. But anyways, you just. Um, going to the games, just listening to people, it just cracks you up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody, everybody has all the answers. You just sit there and just kind of laugh and just like, you know, say a word and then just, but it's like people have no idea how hard it is. You know, football is division one football, how competitive it is. Everybody's got dietitians now. Everybody's got a nutritionist. Everybody's got a masseuse. You know I mean? Everybody's got all these different things. And the margin or the, um, you know, to lose is, is so, there's a thin line. Um, and you, you're up at night, all night, not because you, you want to stay up, but there's so many things you're trying to, mm -hmm. we didn't do this, we didn't do that. And so it's. Um, you mentioned uh, your, so you have two sons that uh, are in the profession. I'm, an I'm anxious to know as you tried to prepare them for what it is, or, or if you're trying to prepare anyone else for what college football is today, uh, what do you think are the, the, the biggest challenges? So these are, these are young men with young families, right? And, and you and I are, um, have a lot of experience doing what they're getting ready to do, but the times and, and the external environment is different now than when we started and it continues to change. If you were to advise your your sons and, and other young coaches that have families, uh, how best to balance? What advice did you give them, and and how best to not only you know be exceptional at their job, but maintaining great family relationships at home? Um, because that's a challenge, right? There's only so much time. Yeah, it's 
it really, in, in most instances, it's not a family friendly profession. And so my my oldest son, Val, wanted to get into it. You know, I just said, son, are you sure you want to do this? Like, you, you know, newly married, you know, he um, you know, had a young daughter, you know. And so I just, are you sure you want to do this? And he said, dad, I think I want to try. So, you know, I, I didn't push him on it. So it was like, hey, you know, obviously you got to try to get a GA job or an job. You just got to try to get one of those. So. He worked on it, and I kind of just left it alone because I wasn't going to push him at all because we know what it takes. Yep. And we know the demand and the rigors and all of the things with this profession. It's There's a lot of beautiful things about our profession, but there are a lot of ugly things. And, and then he came back, hey, Dad, I think I got a shot here, and blah, blah, blah. And, and so I, my – well, if you and your wife, you know, just I said, son, just got to recognize – you may not see your family. I have no idea what this person's hours are going to be. I don't know what your Sunday schedule is going to be. Just recognize it. You may not be able to see your family much. And he's just like that. I think I want to give it a shot. And we talk. And I think we'll give it. we're going to, you know, we're going to try the GA thing for a couple of years and kind of see what happens. And so he he did it, and it was kind of interesting to me because they had long hours, but he he loved it. Mm. And like, oh, because <laughs> uh, how's how's you guys all get that? We met, you know, this long, and um, and he wrote for he worked for Nick Rolovich, and he loved Nick, mm. just loved him. And they had you now just talking about personality, same humor, you know. What I mean, there are just so many things, and so um, he went into that way, and he after the two years, and then he's like, Dad, um, I think we're gonna stay in. So I had a you know I had a position open off the field position and he came and some things worked out where we were able to, you know, promote him along, you know, during the COVID year. But I, I think the advice Bronco was just, you know, that I gave my sons, I was real I was honest with them. I just told them the truth. And I think I think some of it that I was also honest that don't look at my hours. <laughs> mm-hmm. We don't work on Sundays. Mm-hmm. Uh we're at home at night. You know, I'm more of an early morning person. I told our staff, hey, guys, I just, I want to get here early. We're going to start early. But I want you guys to go home at night. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's taking you that long to figure things out, how are our kids going to figure it out in a 45-minute meeting? Yeah. You know what I mean? Keep the main thing the main thing. But I also told them my biggest goal that I want to do is I want to, yes, I want to win football games. just the way you stay um, employed. Mm-hmm. But I want to make sure that our guys are better husbands, fathers, leaders for our country at the Naval Academy. <clears throat> and so more than anything that you could ever say is what you do. Mm-hmm. And so this, these kids aren't in it. Some people aren't done. They, they're like, wait a minute, these guys are here all day. Who's with their family? Who's watching their kids? And so I wanted our players to see that. And so I told my sons, not everybody has this, these kind of hours, you know, and so... I think they kind of saw that, you know. I mean, growing up, and so maybe they thought, "Oh, wow, this is sweet." And like, no, it's it's not like this in most places. But they also didn't see the other side. Like by the time my kids woke up, I was gone. Yep. You mean they didn't see that I, you know, on Mondays I get to work like at three thirty. Yeah. You know what I mean? Not that I was trying to be. I just couldn't sleep because I didn't go into work on 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 Sunday. And I recognize that your competitors are <laughs> they're, yeah. they're pressing ahead. You know, what I mean, they're 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 watching film, and so I had to, you know, make sure that I was doing my due diligence to make sure that our team, my team, was prepared. You know, I wasn't gonna like just sit around and just oh, well, this is what happened. No, you had to go to work. And so, this isn't the most friendly profession uh, as hours go. I think it's it's a very rewarding. Uh, profession from the standpoint of seeing people develop. Mm. You and I have been doing this a long time. So that's the most rewarding thing. Like I said, my son played for you now. He's, you know, 30 with three kids. You know, for us that have been in for a long time, you think the wins are the most important thing, but it's to see who they become. Mm. You know, what they're doing in lives now. And you're like, whoa, you, you start your own company, you know, or whatever. You're just like, you're so proud of them. So you just got to remind guys, um, as I, if they've asked me, questions you know i've just told them hey uh do the best you can when if you're uh to be with your family you know whatever job your coach gives you 
there's things that you won't ever give back. Um, and I used to try to tell guys that just do your best to go home. Like we, you know, I always come, came home for the month of July for, for all these years to Hawaii. And I used to kind of chuckle sometimes because I'd see some family members and friends, and I know they're just some of their comments. They're like, "Wow, <laughs> Ken's got a pretty cruise job. He's home for a month." <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you know, we didn't realize that there was just your time. And I would, and I would just chill. You know, just go back. You know. Um, just relax at the beach, and uh, you know, I got a place in Hawaii, and we would just relax and not do anything. People thought, "Oh, what are you doing in Hawaii? You guys got all these plans?" I go, no, <laughs> just to, we're just gonna relax. <laughs> but you know, like it's just your time to recharge. Is kind of like you're getting ready to another run another race, and you're just like recharging your batteries. You're like storing up for the, yeah. this race. And so, I guess it was a long answer, Bronco. But just trying to tell guys is just. The hours are not great, uh, and if you do love it, it's a great, and there can be a lot of great rewards if you can kind of keep the main thing the main main thing. Uh, the money has become so great too that sometimes guys lose their way, mm-hmm. you know, and it becomes about that and just. But it can be a very rewarding profession, um, and just you know do the best you can with whatever your coach has, but also tell guys, hey, but it's not for everybody. Mm-hmm. And if you give me a job, and it's like I, I can't do this. The hours, um, it's 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 not for everybody. Yeah, you know, it's one of the few professions where um, I think people brag about how much they're at the office. You know, like like it's a, a badge of of honor or courage. Oh yeah, we stay this long, and uh, uh, almost so they say it, but the way it's said is almost like that they're proud of it. And, and um, I usually ask those, those coaches about their values and just conversationally. And, and almost all of them say, you know, uh, family is everything. And I say, wow, that's, that's interesting. And with those hours, can I see your schedule? You know, how, how do you build that in? And, and some will show me their calendar and some won't. But, but really, the, the values didn't match the allocation of time. And I'm not talking about the volume of time. I'm just talking about a, an event per day or, or an, an something that's designated to their own family. Cause so many uh, of us talk about our own football programs and how important family is. Um, and I was, then that usually led me to just ask them about their own family and how do they build that in? And I'm not sure how it was for you, uh, because the hours won't ever match, but there can be something on a daily basis on your calendar that reflects your family is important, right? That you're, you're carving out for them. And, uh, I found that to be really effective. And so with, with the young coaches and guys like your son and Ba'a, it's just what what on each day um, and how does your family know that you truly care? Show me your calendar. You know, where where is it? That thing that you're going to do. And so when I was coaching at Brigham Young University, my wife and I's date night or date afternoon was uh, 12 to 1.30 on Wednesdays. <laughs> so that was and in and, uh, and, and our faith, canonized faith. But a temple is a, is a special place to go to, to worship and be together. And there was a temple close to Brigham Young University in Payson. Uh, and so my wife and I would drive over there and uh, and just be there together and drive back. And that's in the middle of a week. And Wednesday is a heavy work week uh, in the coaching profession. But there's no way I could let her know that she was um, more special than that right in the middle of the of the whole thing you know, carving out an hour and a half, almost symbolically just to say, you know, this still is most important. And, and so Mm -hmm. it wasn't the volume of time, it was just the act, you know, and so uh, as I've tried to advise young people, and especially coaching at BYU, where so many were married, and for those that are listening, sometimes between 30 and 40 players per year. And a lot of that advice was marital advice. And um, one of the simple things was each day, there can be something that lets your spouse and your family know they're important. And then the principle that scheduled events happen more than non-scheduled events. <laughs> so schedule it, right? It's on the calendar. And wow, was that just a nice anchor to, to while the time wasn't the same, um, you could do something, right, that was really impactful. And I think our families appreciate that. Um, and so, man, I know for, and for our listeners, so, um, 
Coach Niamatololo also was a leader of our faith. And so in our congregations, the local leaders are called bishops. And, but there's a, a leader that's kind of over the bishops on larger areas are called stake presidents. A stake is a larger area and Coach Niamatololo was a stake president while, while being a division one football coach, which, which that in and of itself by definition is, is really unheard of. And so, um, as you've already mentioned, uh, you didn't work Sundays as a program and, and nor did we, um, how, how in the world did you manage something of that significance with football and your family all at the same time? I'd love just to hear your approach and, and how that happened. Yeah, like you said, I mean, your, your calendar stuff. I mean, I think the one thing, first of all, trying to help our coaches with that stuff, Mark, I try to make sure that we had their summer calendar, you know, time to be off in the spring, just well in advance. You know, yeah. you're not giving it the week. Hey, guys, by the way, you know, you know, take the next couple of days off on next week. You know, I mean, they don't have time to plan. So just making sure you're thoughtful and respectful of your, your assistant coaches and their wives that that you gave them the schedule long mm. in advance so that they could plan if, for family events to help them that way. But, um, you know, being the state president of, you know, in an, in Annapolis, of, you know, of our church, the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints, it just, it's, uh, you don't, you don't campaign for your callings in church, <laughs> you know, you just, <laughs> they, they just <laughs> that's not normally what you campaign for, and it's, um, so having the calling, um, I thought would be, I wasn't sure at first how I would do everything. And I just trusted in the Lord that everything would work out. Mm. Um, but the great thing in, in our church, as you mentioned, Michael, just everybody has a calling and you just allow people to do wherever their calling is, you know, the the state primary president or the hand with the with the, the, the young children or those with the youth leaders or those with people. I, I was so different. I found it interesting. I was so different as a state president as I was head coach. Like as a head coach, I want to know everything. So why are you doing that? How long is this drill? You know, how come you're spending so much time on backpedaling or oh, whatever? <laughs> we're, in, we're in my church calling. You just you know trust in the Lord. You did your part, but everybody else is doing their part too. You know yeah. we're all trying our best because everybody was busy. You know we're all yeah. busy, and so. You know, try not to do everybody's calling. And just, <laughs> just allow everybody to do their deal. And, um, but it, I, I, it was, I didn't realize at first how I would do things when it was over. It was, it was the most beautiful thing. You mm -hmm. know, just, I realized for me, as I put the Lord first, everything else fell in place for me. Yeah. You know, just, it just all, everything. But I, I always found my profession, if you, if you try to flip it, that way and your career stuff became first. It never worked out. Yeah. You know, just things happen. Mm -hmm. And um so I said the things in it kind of like we were talking about before about the you know just management of time. I remember listening to two coaches. I don't want to say their name because it's yep. I don't want to talk bad about them, but one was a college coach, one was a pro coach and they're very successful. National championship and a Super Bowl win. So they're <laughs> at the pinnacle of what you and I do. You know yeah. what I mean? And so you have all the respect for them. But one of the questions at the end of their seminar um, is like, hey, if you guys have any regrets or uh, anything in your careers? And both of them had the same answer. Mm. And I was a young assistant. It just really had an impact on me. Both of them said, you know, I, I love this profession. I love my, you know, I wouldn't trade anything. Maybe one thing is I wish I'd spent more time with my family. Mm -hmm. But they're retired. It's over. Yeah. I mean, they, they couldn't get that back. Yeah, I just thought I didn't want that. I didn't want that in my own career. Mm. When I became a head coach, I didn't want that for my coaches. You know, I want to make sure that they had time to see their families. And uh, I had a chance to go um, at, when I was at UCLA to go visit, you know, some of the pro teams over there. I was just talking to one of the coaches, a former coach of mine who's on uh, the Ram staff, and he was saying that actually Coach McVay has great hours. Mm -hmm. But he believes in being efficient, come mm -hmm. early, get your work done. But in, you know, uh, but they're not, you know, in there to two o'clock in the morning, sleeping over there. Or yeah. 
Yeah. And I was like, wow, this is a Super Bowl winner. And he, some of the younger generation, because Bronco will tell you this, that nowadays everything, I mean, you can break down anything of anybody and any play, any concept. With the, <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing now all the things you can see. You can pull up NFL teams. And so you can definitely manage your time better. Uh, but for me and my calling, I just, you know, I guess a long answer, Bronco, I just trusted in the Lord. Yeah. Just trusted that everybody else, you know, everybody else is busy and we're all trying to do our best, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and doing our church calling. And that's, that's just what we do. Yeah. It, it's, it's, um, I always appreciated your example from that standpoint. Um, because the, I think in your words, the profession is, is not family friendly. It takes a really intentional leader to make it as family friendly as possible. Right. And, and I always was, was looking at myself. Am I making this? And I was talking about our work environment and this wasn't at the expense of winning. So, you know, you and I both know that that has to happen. Um, so it was. But in addition to that, am I and I was I always used to ask myself this question. Am I making this as family friendly as possible? And and looking for ways to do that again, not at the expense of the outcome but for the sake of principle and beliefs and and then the sunday choice which not many of us made as head coaches and i'm not saying we're better than anyone else it was just in alignment with our beliefs um and and there's a competitive from the world standpoint there's a competitive disadvantage if you're not going to work sundays as you said because monday comes early and most staffs have already worked on sunday and put more hours in and so the efficiency and the effectiveness really becomes paramount. And so I felt the same as you waking up early Monday. Um, however, not regretting what I did Sunday. In fact, cherishing what I did Sunday for the sake of not only my beliefs, but um, for the extra time I could spend with what was truly most important. And so um, I, I admired from afar um, another leader working hard to balance it all. Right. Mm -hmm. And not at the expense of or and not just for the sake of football, but trying to demonstrate with their full capacity, uh, a comprehensive approach and still getting great results, which you did for a long, 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 long time, which I just thought was 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 great and admirable and was always hopeful more would would uh, take that approach. But it's scary because it's not conventional yeah. and most head coaches aren't willing to, to take that risk. However, to me, the risk was greater by not doing that. Um, I, I've always wanted to know also, uh, just, I think our listeners, um, coaching the type of young people uh, that attend the Naval Academy, uh, cause I was always so impressed with who they were, how they played, but just their, their presence, their countenance, how they carried themselves. I'm wondering what it was like to, to select and assess and coach, uh, young people like that. Yeah, they, they were great young men, uh, Bronco just, um, I mean, obviously selfless young men, but you know, they start off the same. Everybody, yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody wants to go to Alabama, you know, everybody wants to go to the league and start to recognize that, you know, hey, maybe they don't have that opportunity. They're grateful for a division mm -hmm. one opportunity, great education, um, having to serve our country, you know, it's not mm -hmm. for everybody. I have the greatest respect for those who serve in our armed services, but just because you don't serve doesn't make you a bad person. Yeah, You know, it's just, but all of us, know somebody by a family member or relative or friend that serves so you got great respect for them but they're great young men but they're also normal you know they're, they're just they you yeah. know they they're just normal young men and so like you said you got to make sure that your values align um and i thought it was interesting just when i uh, first became a head coach and i know you can say the same thing but it's just I thought it would be a lot of the things would be technical. And I'm not saying things are technical, but I, I found myself running our program based on principles. Mm -hmm. Start off with principles. Here are the principles. Yeah. Here are some guiding principles or core principles that I won't get away with. And just make sure the decisions I made uh, aligned with those principles. Uh, yep. You know, I, I there would be times that guys would come back and recruit, hey, coach so and so, this school's doing this and doing that, and they're doing this. And I don't care what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> we just we're gonna do this. Yeah, you know we're gonna do that. And so, but they were a great young man. So you had to make sure that your principles aligned. This is what I tell all of our coaches that came in here, and I said, guys, 
coach somebody like how you want somebody to coach your own child, your son or daughter. And look, I mean, you can coach hard and be demanding, but I don't believe you have to MF kids. I don't believe that one iota. Yeah. Now it doesn't mean, you know, this in this is division one football, this is the grueling, ruthless profession. You gotta be demanding and hold people accountable, but you don't have to MF kids. And Probably one of the greatest compliments I feel like I got, you know, or some uh, from NFL scouts that come to practice, you know, that goes wrong. And they're like, hey, thanks, coach. Thanks for letting us come by. Oh, thank you. Because, coach, that was a pretty unique practice. I've been to a lot of practices. And, and I, you know, I'm starting to get cocky a little bit, like, well, practice <laughs> organized or they like, you know, how we did things. And they said, no, we, I, I don't know if I've been to practice like that where I didn't hear a bunch of F bombs. Yeah. And to me, probably one of the, best compliments and that's not something that you know you see on sports center or you know maybe practices nobody's <laughs> but it was a principle that i wanted you know yeah. what i mean just and as we were with these kids and you're you're recruiting them you bring on trips and you feed them at these nice restaurants you do all those things how did you treat them mm-hmm. you know what i mean it just one of the things I guess I wouldn't have found it out. I guess you would have, you know, when I got let go is just hearing back from your former players. Yeah. It just makes you realize, you know what? I obviously I didn't like the way things ended, but I did things the right way. Yeah. You know, you hear from all of those players when you're, you and I were at places for a long time and I was at the Naval Academy for 25 years. You know, so guys that, you know, just to hear back from those players. But I was going to also share with you, I don't know how much time, but just, so my former strength coach sent me this just yesterday, and I want to share this because I thought mm. it was interesting. And and um, so it was, it was a it was a quote uh, quote by Bruce, you know, uh, against the former Tampa Bay uh, coach. Mm-hmm. But he said, when I hear about guys sleeping in their office, I wonder what you know. What he said, what the they're they're doing there because <laughs> the game ain't that ain't that hard. Their work will always be there. Your kids won't. I tell my coaches, if you miss a recital or a league game, I'll fire you. You know, so I just – and he just said, Coach, thanks thanks for doing that for us. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so I guess, you know, what you said about the players and the coaches, uh, like I said, nobody wants to get fired. But the cool thing after was just to hear from them. And yeah. you get these kind of texts, you know what I mean? It's like it makes you realize, you know, there are some guiding principles that I want to – go by and and I wasn't going to budge from them. Yeah. And now that, you know, whatever, you know, 25 years later, 16 years later as a head coach, I was okay. I could sleep at night. Mm-hmm. I never went to bed at night. Okay. I got to make sure I get there early to shred those papers before the NCAA gets there. <laughs> <laughs> I never worried about that. I never yeah. worried about somebody because, you know, now, could we have tackled better? Could our coverage been better? Could our blocking be better? And yeah, yes, all of that ball security that that always could improve. But I just want to make sure when it's all over, or when you went to bed at night, you weren't up because you're, you know, you had all these, you know, skeletons in your closet, so to speak. Yeah. And, um, yeah, and so they're a great young man. Mm. I work with great coaches, great people. But, I, you know, being at UCLA, I was telling my younger son, like, wow, they got great kids here. Mm-hmm. You know, just a lot of things in our country that, you know, we're trying to work on. But I was telling it's still the greatest country in the world. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not perfect by any means, but what country is? <laughs> mm-hmm. It's still run by people, <laughs> you know. And so, but it's still, this country is a great country. And I just felt very privileged and honored to have been at an institution where we had a small part in helping develop some young men that would serve our country and protect our freedoms. So we can have podcasts and different things. I mean, we're in a country that allows us these freedoms and you know, I'm great. I was honored for that opportunity. Uh, it's, it's just, um, I think college football uh, benefited from that. Not only the kids in the, the military academies that, that played football, uh, but the leadership uh, that you exhibited there, that that in and of itself, uh, I think matched so many values that um, I think people aspired to and wanted to emulate and wanted to be proud of. And, and so I think there's a special responsibility that comes if you're coaching at one of the academies. And 
And when you could do it with the grace and dignity, but also the principles in which you did it, I think there's a huge benefit, not only to college football, but I think to our country. Um, and so it's, it's hard to, it's hard, I think maybe for a lot of folks to understand what that required, but not me. And so I, I thought it was great and just really appreciate you coming on today to, to share some of the experiences and your thoughts. And um, yeah, really appreciate you being here. So thank you. Thank you, Bronco. Thanks for having me. And thank you. You know what I mean? Just for all the men that, you know, that you've groomed over the years, you know, both coaches and players and my son being one of them. And thank you for your, you know, your hand in helping mold him and raise him. Now he's a father of three kids. You know what I mean? But a lot of it is the stuff that you taught him and your, and your coaches. And, uh, we, we certainly appreciate that, Kenny. And uh, certainly can can see the emotion that uh, you have and and the connection that you two have. And I I, I did want to follow up on the, on that just a little bit because I so rarely get a chance to ask how is Bronco as a recruiter being being the parent considering your son ended up playing for him. Bronco is the thing I loved about Bronco. He's very honest. You know, I mean, he doesn't try to you know, you know, he just tells kids the truth. You know, I just remember being in with my younger son with him, and, and Bronco is very very honest. And I just love that about him. And, you know, just as a, as a, as a coach, I know he's a, a, a great football mind and a great coach, but just hearing my son, just his lessons, you know what I mean? Just, um, you know, the perfect, uh, what did you guys have? Perfect tens. Perfect tens. Yeah. Perfect tens and just these different things, just the attention detail on, on his stuff. And I would just kind of chuckle because as a player, like, man, we ran all this stuff. But I see he is incorporate a lot of those principles that Bronco had. You know what I mean? Just uh, sorry about that. I, I messed <laughs> I've messed them up forever. I I, I apologize in advance. <laughs> well, I remember you know just us watching. I mean, whether you're at Virginia or even at BYU, I mean, some of those principles that you know running to the ball, being in best. I mean, that was a hallmark of Bronco men in all defenses. I mean, they they were going to run to the football. And so you try to watch, you know, guys that other people that are doing at an elite level, and you just try to try to emulate, you know, some of the things that they did. And so, but it was awesome. He was a, um, I know a lot of principles that my son uses, you know, hopefully some of them from my wife and I, more my wife than me, um, <laughs> you know, church gospel of Jesus Christ related, but also the, the, the men that he's been around, Coach Tidwell, his position coach. Mm -hmm. Coach Mendenhall, his high school coach, and I'm grateful for, you know, coaches that have had a hand in, you know, in raising my son. But those are the most rewarding thing that Bronco and I can say coming from this profession. It's the after stuff and seeing yeah. that you don't realize that, you know, the perfect tens was, you know, you're trying to accomplish some football, but there are other life lessons that they got from it. Mm -hmm. You know, attention to detail, doing things the right way. But Bronco was uh, honest. You knew where he stood. Wasn't shooting some of the BS that other people just you just knew when you went okay, this is your status here or this is where we're at and so I really appreciate that with him. Well, we certainly appreciate uh, the the time, Ken. It's going to be a little little strange seeing you run out at the Rose Bowl this this year, but uh, best of luck <laughs> with the Bruins after uh, so many uh, successful years at the Naval Academy for Bronco Mendenhall and Ken Niamatololo. I am Brian Fisher. We'll catch you again next week.